Morning, family. Great, so Mark 2, 23 to 3, 6. One Sabbath, he was going through the cornfields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck ears of corn. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked round at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This is the word of God. Well, as we come to God's word, let's bow and ask God to help us. <clears throat> Father, your word tells us that all scripture is God-breathed, that the author of scripture is the spirit of God, God himself. And Father, we have the Bible open in front of us, and so we do pray that that same spirit may open our eyes and take away the hardness from our hearts and we pray lord that we may be drawn closer to christ through his word and by his spirit and we pray this for christ's sake amen Well, as you well know, there are four biographical accounts of the person of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are the source documents, the source material of, of the Christian faith. What we have in front of us here is the Gospel of Mark. Remember, the author was Mark, also called John Mark. And we meet the same John Mark in the early church in the book of Acts chapter 12 to 15. He was probably, John Mark was probably an African. He was probably born in Libya, in Cyrene. And uh, he was a scribe to the Apostle Peter. So the Apostle Peter, as you well know, was one of the closest disciples of Jesus. And uh, Peter shared and gave the eyewitness testimony of the teaching and the acts and the works of Jesus. And John Mark was the scribe, writing down what uh, Peter had said. In actual fact, someone said what we probably have here are the sermons of Peter, which is a fascinating thought. He was writing round about uh, the date 65 AD, so that's about 32, 33 years after the life, the death, resurrection of Christ. Uh, they dated 65 AD just after the great fire in Rome, which was in 64 AD, and he was writing this just before the, uh, the martyrdom of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul uh, during the brutal regime of Emperor Nero. You'll remember chapter 2, verse 3. Have a look at chapter 2, verse not 3, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7, you'll, you'll remember that Jesus claimed to forgive sin. And the religious leaders of the day called that blasphemy. But now in this passage that we have open in front of us, Jesus 
makes a claim that is so outrageous that the, that the leaders actually don't have a word for it. You see, in our passage that we're looking at today, Jesus tells us, he tells his readers, Mark tells his readers, that Jesus has not come to reform religion. He's come to bring an end to religion and to replace it with himself. So that's the bombshell of this passage. And probably the key verse there is verse 27 and verse 28 of chapter 2. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So we're going to unpack these two uh, cameos under two headings. Jesus claims the Sabbath as a blessing. And then secondly, Jesus claims the end of religion. So those will be our two main principles as we work our way through this passage. Let me just go down two side roads. Side road number one. You'll remember that John Mark was a very astute author. So you can read Mark's gospel at 16 chapters in probably one to two hours. But in actual fact, the ministry of Jesus was three years. So John Mark was very selective in what he included. So every verse, every portion has a purpose. And what John Mark does, which is absolutely brilliant, is he's teaching us Christian truth. He's teaching us theology through narratives, through stories, true stories, which is actually a very African thing to do. Very often, African truth is taught through proverbs, through stories. And that's exactly what Mark is doing here. He's teaching Christian truth, Christian doctrine, through narrative. You'll remember that in these opening chapters of Mark's Gospel, uh, John Mark is really answering the question, who is Jesus? And he does that through these narratives, through these stories. And the overriding answer as you read these opening chapters is that Jesus is a man with authority, extraordinary authority. In fact, there's never been anyone like him. So quickly, flip back to chapter 1. And you'll see how brilliant Mark is in using stories to convey theology. Chapter 1, verse 17, notice there, Jesus has authority over people. He says to, to, to these four tough businessmen, fishermen, follow me, and immediately they follow him. Chapter 1, verse 25, notice, Jesus has authority over the supernatural world. He commands an evil spirit to come out of a man, and the spirit obeys him instantly. Chapter 1, verse 31, notice there, Jesus has authority over physical illness. Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus supernaturally, instantly heals her. Chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus has authority over sin. He says to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, and they are. Chapter 2, verse 28, Jesus has authority over time. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, and he is. Chapter 4, verse 39, you'll have to skip over a few pages. Chapter 4, verse 39, Jesus has authority, not just over the supernatural world, but over the natural world, over the physical world. He tells the wind and waves to be still, and instantly they obey him. Chapter 5, verse 41, last one, 5, verse 41. 41, Jesus has authority over death itself. He tells a young girl to, to rise up, and she does. So John Mark is using narrative to show us, not just to tell us, but to show us that Jesus has authority. Can you imagine anybody else having the authority of Jesus? Muhammad never claimed to have that authority. Buddha never claimed to have that, that authority. Of course, the Beatles said that they were more popular than Jesus. And where are they now? Robert Mugabe said that he had been resurrected more times than Jesus himself, which may well be so. It's just he couldn't pull off the final one. No, Jesus has extraordinary Authority, supernatural authority, more than any other human being. Do you really think it's possible that Jesus could be anything other than the Son of God? Remember that great quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, I quote, 
I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept, accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit, him, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to, end of quote. So actually, you've got three choices. Either he was a liar, either he was a lunatic, or he was Lord. The option of saying he was a great man, a great human being, isn't open to us because no great human being would have said the things that Jesus said. Side road number two. Second thing that John Mark wants us to understand is not only the authority of Jesus, but the opposition to Jesus. It's almost two sides of the same coin as you read the Gospels. All the Gospels, you see this, the authority of Christ and the opposition to Christ. And here from chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 6, John Mark gives us five narratives, five cameos, all of them showing this escalating conflict, this escalating opposition by the leaders of Israel to Jesus. Let me give you those five cameos very quickly. Notice the first cameo, chapter 2, verse 7. When Jesus forgives the paralytic, they charge him with blasphemy. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Cameo number 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 16. When Jesus fraternizes with sinners and tax collectors, they charge him with compromising the faith. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Cameo number 3, chapter 2, verse 18, they charge him with a lack of religious commitment. Jesus, why do, you, why do your disciples not fast as required by the law? Cameo number 4, chapter 2, verse 24, our passage, they charge him with breaking the law. He's a lawbreaker. Jesus, why are your disciples doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And so cameo number 5, chapter 3, verse 6, we're not surprised that this escalating conflict, this growing hostility, culminates in verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. So let's not miss what's happening here. Jesus has a contract on his life. They're plotting to kill him. It's a hit. This is Mafia 101. When you, when you proclaim, when you live, when you share, when you testify, when you preach about the authority of Christ, the uniqueness of Christ, you will, more often than not, face opposition. That's what Mark is teaching us. Sometimes I read in overseas missions uh, websites that Africa is hungry to hear the gospel. Well, it must be written by people who have never been to Africa because... Um, no one's hungry to hear the gospel unless God, the Holy Spirit, is working in their hearts. No, where I live in Africa, people ignore the gospel. People reject the gospel. People hate the gospel. Isn't that right? When you stand up for truth amongst your family, perhaps at a Sunday lunch today, or in the office tomorrow morning, you have opposition. People don't like what you say. People don't like the stark claims of Christ. So John Mark isn't only telling us what happened with Jesus, that he was rejected, he was hated, it ended at the cross. So Jesus, from chapter 3, verse 6, is living in the shadow of the cross. The contract was fulfilled. Mafia 101 works. But he's also telling us, us, it'll be no different for Jesus' followers. It's part of the territory. You may not have realized it, but this is what you signed up for. Turn quickly to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, 
where Jesus makes that quite explicit. Matthew chapter 5, and remember Matthew was probably written by the Levi that was called in Mark chapter 2, the, the tax collector, Levi called Matthew. And Matthew gives us an eyewitness report of the teaching of Jesus, and Matthew uh, um, recalls what Jesus said, Matthew 5 verse 11, he said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Notice it's on my account. They're not persecuting you because you're obnoxious. You're on your own. No, you are being persecuted on my account. Rejoice and be glad. I mean, that's, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? I'd be complaining. No, Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. John Mark says, so they persecuted the Savior who came before you. Don't be surprised. It's part of the territory to be a Jesus follower. All right, let's have a look at the two main principles Principle number one. You're still with me? I hope so. Jesus claims the Sabbath as a blessing. We back to Mark. Mark chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, of course, the Sabbath goes back to Genesis 2. Six days work, one day rest. That was God's God's rhythm for daily life. That's God's design for us as human beings. And for Israel, it was one of the things that distinguished them from the other nations. Sadly, what the Pharisees did was that they turned a blessing, a joy, into a ritual, into a burden, into a legalism. And they regarded the themselves as the custodians, the interpreters of the Old Testament, and they believed the only way you could merit your way to God's favor was to scrupulously obey the law of Torah. And they added hundreds of man-made laws and rules to the word of God and the law of God, and they particularly applied that to the Sabbath. So when Jesus heals the man in chapter 3, verse 5, on the Sabbath, that was breaking their laws. Healing was work. And so healing someone according to their man-made laws, not according to the scriptures, was breaking the Sabbath. Chapter 2, verse 23, plucking heads of corn was regarded as reaping, and reaping was work, and reaping and, and reaping was prohibited on the Sabbath. Preparing a meal was regarded as work, so it was prohibited on the Sabbath. You had to prepare your meals before the Sabbath. It was a nitpicking, nit, nitpicking legalism through which you were meant to win merit or favor with God. For instance, let me give you just one obscure example. If a wall fell onto someone, this is how detailed they were. This is how legalistic they, they were. If a wall fell onto someone, you could dig away the rubble to see if he was alive or dead. If he was alive, you could drag him out If he was dead, you had to leave the body there until the Sabbath was over. You see why Jesus got so angry at their religion, chapter 3, verse 5. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. In the Old Testament, in the temple, they would put 12 loaves of bread which were consecrated to God, and only the priests in the temple could eat of that bread And yet Jesus says there are times when the laws of need override the laws of ritual and by no less a person than King David. So what he's saying is that even in the Old Testament, human need was more important than religious ritual. And then Jesus says, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. When Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, he's saying that the Sabbath is not meant to be a burden. It's meant to be a blessing. And what's more, verse 28, the Sabbath is no longer 
about earning your way to heaven, about rules and regulations. No, it's under entirely new management. When he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, he's actually saying, I am the Sabbath. Now let me just step back for a couple of moments and look at the original purpose of Sabbath so that we can understand what Jesus is saying here. The original purpose of the Sabbath wasn't about countless rules and regulations. It was meant to be a blessing, not a burden. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Here we have the original instructions from the Ten Commandments about the Sabbath. Deuteronomy chapter 5, and I'll read from verse 12 to 14. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Imagine never, never having a rest from work. Imagine being on an endless treadmill with no off button. Perhaps that's how you feel this morning. Well, God in his goodness, in his kindness, he established a day of rest, one out of seven. So for most of us, that means five days at the office or five days on Zoom at home. And the sixth day, we're doing chores and shopping and maintenance and one day rest. One day when we cease from our labors, cease from our striving. One day when we take a break and we remember who God is and what he's done for us. The word recreation is the idea of being recreated, of being refreshed of resting so that Monday morning we have energy, new energy, to work. And notice verse 14, it wasn't just meant for us, it was meant for our employees, our staff, our family. In the days of Charles Dickens, we were at school together, by the way, and um, <laughs> he wasn't that bright. Um, <laughs> In the days of Charles Dickens, it was the working class who desperately needed this commandment. My guess is that in our day, it's the professional class and the business class who desperately need to remember this commandment. I sometimes hear of professional people who work seven days a week, week after week after week. Interesting that in the 1920s in communist Russia, they did away with the seven-day week, and they established a ten-day week, nine days work, one day rest, so that they could increase productivity. It was quickly abandoned because um, productivity plummeted, obviously. We've all had times where we've had to work seven days, ten days, 14 days at a stretch, at the end of which you feel motherless, don't you? You feel absolutely wiped out. You feel dehumanized. You see, six days work, one day rest is an enormous blessing to us. And I must be honest and say I have not always kept it, sadly. Let me draw out two principles. Number one, what we have here is religion versus the gospel. So in these two cameos, we don't just have two different viewpoints, two different opinions. No, we have two different paradigms. The Pharisees, it's religion. And religion has to do with commands. Most people in this world who believe, those who believe that there's, that there's a God, they believe that, that you relate to him by being good. In fact, you need to be very good. Now, there are millions of variations of that religion. But the fundamental basis is that there's a code of conduct and you need to keep it. The logic is, if I perform, if I obey, then I will be accepted. That's the one paradigm. It's religion. It's based on commands. The other paradigm is the gospel, which you remember from chapter 1 is not commands. It's news. That's the nature of the gospel. It's not commands. It's news. It's good news. 
not of what we do, but what Christ has done for us, what God has done for us in Christ. So I'm accepted not because of what I do. No, I'm accepted because of what Christ has done for me. That's the news of the gospel. In 1981, there was a movie called The Chariots of Fire. It was a historical drama, and it was about two British athletes in the 1924 um, Olympic Games. One was called Eric Little. He was a devout Scottish Christian, and the other was Harold Abrahams, who was an English Jew. So at one level, the movie was about Little not running on the Sabbath, and losing the opportunity to, to win a gold medal. But at another level, the movie was actually about identity. Both of them were trying to win gold medals. But Abrahams did it to prove himself. So at one, one, one uh, point, speaking about the 100 yards he was just about to uh, take part in, he said, I've, I've got 10 seconds to justify my existence. Little ran for the glory of God. That's why he said to his sister, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. So Harold Abrams was weary even when he rested. Eric Little was rested even when he exerted himself. Why? Because there's a work underneath our work that we really need rest from. It's the work of self-justification. It's the work that often leads people to the refuge of religion, self-justification. So my identity, my security, my self-justification is found in obeying the law. It's found in proving to myself, proving to others that I'm a good person, good enough for God. That's the work underneath the work. The problem is, it's never finished. It never ends. It's only finished when you rest in the finished work of Christ. So at the end of the great work of creation, God said, it is finished, and he rested. At the end of the great act of redemption, the Son of God said, it is finished. And we rested. See, it's the work under your work which makes you really weary. Trying to be good enough for yourself, trying to be good enough for others, trying to be good enough for your family, trying to be good enough for your in-laws, trying to prove yourself, justify your existence. My dear friends, it's only in the cross, it's only in Christ that you will find rest. Christ has lived the life you and I should have lived. He has obeyed the law perfectly. Christ has died the death that we should have died. If you rest in the finished work of Christ, you'll know that God is satisfied with you. And you can rest. A woman came to the great preacher Charles Spurgeon one day, and she said to him, Dr. Spurgeon, I just want you to know that I have been perfect for three months. And uh, Dr. Spurgeon very wisely said, Madam, you must be very proud of that. Number one, she was lying. Number two, she's into religion, isn't she? You only find rest when you rest in the finished work of Christ. Principle number two, what we have here, have a look at verse 28 is not just a contrast between religion and the gospel, but we have deep rest. When Jesus says, verse 28, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, he's actually saying, I am the Sabbath. So the word Sabbath means deep rest, deep peace, shalom, state of wholeness, of flourishing, of health. Doctors will tell you, you don't just need short naps, no, you need deep sleep, REM sleep. So the day of rest the seventh day, is just a nap. It's just a pointer. It's just a taste, a shadow of true rest. And Jesus is the ultimate Sabbath. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 verse 28. Matthew 11 verse 28. 
here are these wonderful words of Jesus. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What he's saying is, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. That's what he's saying. So he's not just talking about a day of rest. He's not just talking about giving you a break, taking away the stress or the anxiety of life. No, he's talking about rest from your sin. He's talking about rest from guilt. He's talking about rest from struggle. He's talking about a rest from striving, a rest from proving yourself, a rest from self-justification, a rest from your DIY religion. I will give you Sabbath. Remember that quote from the secular author Douglas Copeland. Great author. He wrote the book Life After God. And this is what he said. I quote, and here's my secret. My secret is that I need God and that I'm sick and can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be able, capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Deep rest. He's the only one who can satisfy the deep longings of our soul. All right, principle number one was that Jesus claims the Sabbath as a blessing. Principle number two, Jesus claims the end of religion. Let me read from chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, back to Mark's gospel. Back to Mark's gospel. Let's find it. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with a withered hand, Come here. And he said to him, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Now, it's quite obvious when you read this passage that the Pharisees had no concern for the man with a deformed hand. No empathy, no compassion, no love. Their only concern was whether Christ would break another of their laws concerning the Sabbath. It's their hardness of hearts, notice there verse 2, that angers Jesus. They ignore the man's need. They tolerate human suffering in order to use it as a leverage against Jesus. All they're doing is using the handicapped man. And that's why Jesus is angry. Jesus never uses people, be they powerful powerful or powerless. He never uses them for ulterior purposes. Doesn't that anger you when people use you? Well, take heart. Jesus is equally angered. Notice verse 4. He said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. The reason they remain silent is obvious. It's obviously lawful to do good or to save life on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a blessing. And Jesus sees straight through them. And this is a bit scary because he sees through them and he sees through us as well, by the way. He sees through them. And the question that he asks there, verse 4, is filled with irony. He says, you don't want me to heal and save life on the Sabbath because it goes against your precious man-made self-righteous regulations, but you're quite happy to conspire and kill on the Sabbath. You see see the irony? The hypocrisy is exposed. The light has exposed their bitter, twisted, self-righteous hearts. It's scary, isn't it? He can see straight through us. And Jesus is angry. He's furious. He really is furious, verse 5. And he looked around them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. 
He uses three strong Greek words there, anger, grieved or deeply distressed, grieved at their stubborn hearts, the hardness of their hearts, meaning they are resolutely unwilling to understand. They have set their hearts against Jesus. They're not willing to listen. They've set their hearts against God. Beware that you never get to that position. God's anger is very different from our anger. So when we're angry, generally speaking, we lose our temper, we, we fly off the handle, we say things, we do things, we regret. That's normally human anger. God's anger is never like that. It's righteous indignation. It's a settled, rightful opposition to what is evil and unjust and rebellious. Someone once said to me, I can't believe in a God who's a God of wrath and anger, a God of fire and brimstone. And I say to them, are you saying to me, just help me to understand, are you saying that, that God is indifferent to evil? Are you saying God is indifferent or neutral when Hitler kills six, seven, eight million people? Are you indifferent? Do you, do you think God is indifferent when a woman is raped? Do you think God is neutral, indifferent when there's corruption or crime? Do you think God's indifferent when... When someone, God forbid, abuses your, your wife, your daughter. And of course they said, well, I never thought about it that way. It's interesting, when, when you read the Gospels, Jesus doesn't become angry with sin. He doesn't become angry with questions. He doesn't become angry with, out, with doubt. He doesn't become angry with brokenness. But he does become angry with hypocrisy. So the word, our English word hypocrite comes from the Greek word eupocritus, which was used for a Greek actor. So you would act on a stage and you would be called, not an actor, you would be called a eupocritus, which means that you were one person on the stage, but another person when you got off the stage. Well, of course, that's what a hypocrite is. you two people. In certain circumstances, you're one person. In others, you are another. And Jesus is angry because here are people, religious leaders, the leaders of Israel, pretending to know God, pretending to teach people about God, pretending to be religious and God-fearing, and yet back at the ranch, they are smug, self-righteous people. Later, Jesus says, I, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead man's bones and uncleanness. What a destructive comment. You are like whitewashed tombs. You're white and beautiful on the outside, but inside you are full with dead man's bones. So Jesus says to all hypocrites, both then and now, to you and to me, get in or get out, but stop blocking the door so that others can see the real thing. Get in or get out. He also becomes angry with religion. When Jesus says to the man, verse 5, stretch out your hand, he stretches it out and Jesus heals his hand. It's a full frontal in your face attack on the Pharisees and their man-made religion, their laws on the Sabbath. Again, Jesus says later on, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Let me close and say, Jesus, in these two narratives, these two cameos, is not saying, I've come to reform religion. He's not saying that. He's not saying, I've come to give you a better religion. He's not saying, I've come to give you the best religion. No, he says, I've come to bring the end of religion and replace it with myself. I've come to abolish religion. Imagine a conversation in the early church between a Christian and her pagan neighbor in Rome. Oh, says the neighbor leaning over the fence at the back garden. 
I hear you are religious. That's great, you know. Religion is very good. It's a good thing. Where is your holy place or your temple? And the Christian says, well, we have no temple because Jesus is our temple. No temple, says the neighbor, but where do your priests work and do their rituals? Well, we don't have priests to mediate the presence of God, says the Christian. Jesus is our priest. No priest, says the neighbor, but, but where do you offer your sacrifices to acquire the favor of God? And the Christian says, well, we don't need a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. And the pagan neighbor says, well, what kind, <laughs> what kind of religion is that? And the Christian says, it's no kind of religion at all. Well, let's pray. Let's spend a few moments of quiet as we reflect on the word of God, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, and remember what Christ has done for us, the finished work of Christ on the cross. You tell God where you are. Father, we do pray that we may be convicted by your word and by your spirit. Will you forgive us when we've tried to earn our way to heaven? Will you forgive us when we've been self-righteous, when we've tried to merit a favor with God? Forgive us, Lord, when we've thought or we've communicated that Christianity is a religion and not a relationship with Christ. Forgive us, Lord, even as your children, when sometimes we, we strive to earn your favor, not remembering the finished work of Christ on the cross. Father, we thank you that Christ obeyed you perfectly in his life. Christ died in our place in his death. Thank you for that good, good news that there's forgiveness and cleansing and acceptance in Christ. And Father, as we come to, to the Lord's table, we know that the bread and the grape juice is only bread and grape juice, but we know that it's a picture, it's a reminder of the finished work of Christ. That He gave his body, he gave his blood to rescue sinners like us. And so, Lord, as we come to your table again, will you remind us of that great, great truth and Lord, for some who take part in the Lord's table, Lord, will you today bring new life and freedom as they rest in the finished work of Christ? Amen. Well, if you've brought some uh, grape juice or something to drink or uh, bread or a biscuit, you may want to take that out. If you are at home, you may want to bring out the bread and the grape juice or the water, so that we may partake in the Lord's table. There's nothing mystical or magical. The Lord Jesus said we are to do this in remembrance of his death. And because we forget so easily, don't we? We do so regularly to remind ourselves of who we are. I'm going to say a few words, and then when I take of the bread, will you partake either physically or, or in spirit. You may not have actual bread or grape juice, and that's fine. In spirit and in your heart, you join me. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And Father, once again, we thank you for your, your amazing love, your amazing grace, your amazing mercy, that you should take the punishment that we deserve, that Christ should quench the wrath of God so that we may be forgiven. Father, we thank you for the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And we pray, Lord, that these words, these truths, you may write upon our hearts, upon our minds, and that we may live to serve this wonderful Savior, this wonderful Sabbath, the only one who can give rest, deep rest, to our souls. Father, we thank you for being with us here today by your Spirit. Thank you for speaking to us through your Word. Pray that you will send us out out and go with us, that we may serve you and live for you and love you wherever you've placed us. Give us wisdom, give us courage, Help us to stand for Christ and speak for Christ this week. And we pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Well, again, it's been so good to have you here with us this morning in the auditorium, also online. We'll be back next week, God willing. If you can read the portion from Mark chapter 3 from verse 7 onwards. And we'll be picking up again next week. God bless you and have a good week.